Greetings, everyone. Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books, and I am really excited today. We are talking to Jen Chaplin, who is the author of my autobiography of Carson McCullers, which I believe was recently listed as a finalist for the National Book Award, correct? That's right. Congratulations. That's wonderful and well-deserved. Thanks so much. This is, this is a really interesting book coming out at a time when I think many of us are paying a lot of attention to new forms of life writing, mm -hmm. um, you know, which sometimes people call auto fiction, even auto theory, works that really are not just autobiographical, but that use either theoretical constructs or other or, or, or other other constructs. In this case, the figure of Carson McCullers and her archive to actually do some some work around, you know, thinking critically about the self. So in your book, you talk about how you came to this project, but I'd love to hear, you know, just kind of an encapsulated form for people listening. How did you come to this project? And why, um, why Carson McCullers? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, because before I really got into this, I didn't know very much about her. I, I hadn't even really read a lot of her work, but I kind of moved from an academic place to a literary place in the process of writing the book. So I was in graduate school. I was uh, working on a PhD in English and interning at the Harry Ransom Center, which is a humanities archive at UT Austin, um, and found these letters that had been written to Carson McCullers from a woman named Anne Marie Schwarzenbach, and they were these love letters, and I was kind of in the process of um, coming out of a closeted relationship and navigating my own coming out and, and determining my own sexual identity at that time. And so these letters just like really hit home with me and I, they were so interesting. So I wanted to know so much more about these two women and their relationship. And then when I started researching and reading uh, about Carson McCullers, that was just not, that story was not really told in the way that really reflected the materials I'd found. So the project ended up being me looking for that story. Like, where's this love story? Where's this relationship? Where's a more accurate portrayal of it? Because what I kept reading was that, you know, it was this sort of unrequited crush uh, that Carson had, and, and that didn't feel true to me. So I kind of kept digging and went to her childhood home, went to Yaddo, you know, deeper into the archives to, to figure out where that story was. I love it. And that alone, just the story, the, the sort of untold story or correcting the what really are the wrongly told stories about McCullers, that itself is a, is a project and a very scholarly project. But, but you chose to also think your investigation, as it were, of that story in terms of your own story as well, in terms of your own coming to, uh, I don't even know how do, how do we talk about these things anymore, C coming to identity. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> when identity is only ever a process. Exactly. So, and, and the book is as compelling for what it says about about you. And I'm just, I'm just kind of curious how how have you continued to grow with Carson McCullers? Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to well to write a, a book that's kind of a memoir when I'm like was really young when I started it and and kind of still very much in the process of sorting all that out. Someone said to me recently, kind of like offhand, oh, it seems like you do all this research in your writing as a way to figure out something about yourself, which I think many people would find obvious. And I was like, I, I guess I do that. Like I just had never occurred to me that that's what I was doing. Um, but with Carson specifically, um, I was really wanting to tease out kind of the overlap in our lives and kind of the way that I was, I almost like latched on to her identity and her story and it became so important to me. That happens a lot of times, I think for, especially for queer people kind of in the process of coming of age or whatever, like, you know, you, you find an icon, you find a role model, you find someone um, and you become really invested in their story as you're trying to figure out your own or, or figure out who you're gonna be. And for me, that was Carson. But at the same time, uh, as I was researching her life, there were these huge gaps or these erasures, these moments where people had really rewritten her story. Um, and it became clear, you know, as I went along that, because so much was missing, the only way to really bring in the sort of emotional heft of, you know, what her life was like was to actually talk about what my life was like, to, to understand what it was like for her to have 
been sort of closeted within her family, I had to talk about being closeted in my family, you know, and I had to talk about being outed to my family, just like she was outed to her family. And like all of that, um, I think became more emotionally relevant because I was able to bring in some of my own experiences to sort of say, not that she necessarily experienced exactly what I did, but I could see in the way she talks about this, I can really relate to that. I can really identify with those feelings. Oh, it's it's beautiful. I was really moved by the moments in your in your book when you talk about either being in the archive or or being at her home and and seeing her things, seeing the dresses that she wore, for instance. Um, say a little bit, if you don't mind, about the power of of those just kind of material objects and how they relate to your understanding of Carson, but also your understanding of yourself. Yeah, I, I got really interested in the clothes while I was at the Ransom Center because I, you know, there's all these books and manuscripts and letters, but there's also this whole room of stuff that's people's clothes and their knickknacks and their typewriters and their shoes, like really random stuff makes its way into a big archive like that. And historically, uh, scholars don't really know what to do with those materials and archivists don't know what to do with it. So they kind of box it and put it aside and it's there, but no one really looks at it. And I was just like totally enthralled by these objects. Um, and especially with Carson, because I felt like they, they were some of the first material I found that was starting to show another side of her. Um, and one of the sides that uh, her clothes at the Ransom Center showed was like there was a set of cotton nightgowns, which I thought was super strange when I first came across them, because we have like some outfits that she wore, you know, famously in photographs and like tweed skirt suits and things that were very of the kind of 1950s, 1960s, but then these cotton nightgowns. And I was like, why the hell are these in here? And it kind of took me a long time deep into the research to realize that when, she, you know, later in her life, um, she was chronically ill throughout her life, but later in her life, she would, um, be bedridden wearing one of these nightgowns and then throw on, you know, like a really cute jacket or like vest or something for a photograph. And if you look at some fa famous photos of her by Cecil Beaton and others, um, that's what she's wearing. Uh, underneath the little jacket, you can see the nightgown. So the clothes really, again, started to reveal some layers of her story that uh, w wasn't in print, you know, that wasn't being recorded elsewhere, I felt. It was also a way to kind of relate more tangibly to her life. Um, the house in particular, going to stay in her childhood home in Columbus, I did because I felt like I wanted to know her better. Um, a funny thing that's come up like over and over when I talk to people about the book is the question of like, did I encounter Carson McCullough's ghost at her home? And I'm always like, no, <laughs> like, <laughs> what are you talking about? But, uh, but it was, but there is something really palpable to, you know, being in someone's space, being surrounded by their belongings. And in that house, it's like a museum to her. It has belongings from, you know, over the course of her whole life that have all just been gathered into this house kind of willy nilly. You don't know if you can sit on the furniture or, or you know, what you're supposed to do with any of it, which things belong to her, which things didn't. Um, and, and being in that space and also being in the place where she grew up, the climate and the uh, neighborhood, obviously very different now, but still there's just, there's so much that you can learn kind of about the emotional quality of someone's life from those objects in those spaces. You're talking about very embodied ways of knowing these spirits. <laughs> and I, I, I think that's wonderful, especially the, the, the material about the nightgowns, which, um, I think probably gave you and, and then in turn give your readers a really felt sense of her illness, of her disability, you know, of, of her of her embodiment. Sure. Um, so what's a couple of other questions real quick. What's what's interesting to me about uh, about the book and really in some ways a, a centerpiece of it is the the relationship that McCullers has with a therapist, mm -hmm. uh, which is clearly one of the great loves of of her life and and one that uh, I think we're only really now, thanks in large part to your work, beginning to understand. And I'm, I'm wondering, it's easy to judge, you know, from a contemporary perspective, <laughs> what, what, what that relationship was like. And I'm wondering, how, did you feel yourself at times as though you were prying into this, this very special, um, very private moment between Carson and therapist? Definitely, um, because, you know, I first 
really started to understand Carson's relationship with Mary, the therapist, in Columbus, in the archives there, they have the transcripts of their therapy sessions um, that Carson had recorded uh, and then transcribed. So at first you're like, oh, should I even request someone's therapy transcripts? Like that just seems like such a breach, you know, breach of confidentiality, breach of privacy. Um, but then as I, you know, read about them and, and understood it better, I realized that she was having her therapy recorded because she wanted to use it as the rough draft of her memoir that she had been working on. And so she wanted this material to be made into her life story. And, and this was kind of supposed to be sort of her working through those ideas. She was playing the therapy tapes to her friends, to her family members, to like anyone who would listen. She was definitely not private about this material. And so that sort of almost gave me a sense of permission um, to kind of to read those and to think about them as more of a literary archival document, since she was thinking about this as draft material. But still, you know, there's really personal stuff in there. Um, and there's really, you know, private moments from her life, some of her sexual experiences that uh, she hadn't really written about or talked about elsewhere in writing um, are there in those tapes. And so even some of those moments writing about them, like her kind of sexual encounter that she describes with Anne Marie, which is one of the things that she tries to talk about in each therapy session, like it keeps coming back to that. Um, writing about that was so uncomfortable for me. Like it's uncomfortable for me because like I'm from the Midwest and I was raised Catholic. So I'm very like, ooh, just hesitant to even talk about sex uh, period. But then to, to have someone's like own like extremely like vulnerable moment of sort of like consummation and rejection and, and then to have to render that on the page, that was just, uh, it was super tricky, super difficult. Um, but I was kind of driven all along by this feeling that like Carson wanted to tell the story. She wanted Anne Marie and her letters to be part of her memoir. She wanted this story to be part of her memoir. So someone's got to help the story live on, you know, because otherwise, uh, you know, it's been sort of buried by these other narratives. And might have been really hard to tell at that particular time, perhaps. Yeah. Although, you know, in, in looking back at her works through through the lens of your book, I, I am impressed all over again by how much she actually was able to talk about and did talk about in her novels. So yes, so true. Yeah. So what's what's interesting, you know, before I get to my final question, one other one other thought about this. I'm I'm wondering if, you know, given some of the own reticence that you owned about about telling that those intimate parts of her story, was there ever a sense that, okay, well if I tell intimate parts of my story, it's a fair trade. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. No, I didn't think of it that way. Um, but the, I do, you know, there was a little bit of uh, of feeling like once I had some of her story on the page, like needing to have myself be made as vulnerable to a certain extent. So I don't know if it was a trade off, but I, I think it was more um, just a sense that uh, like if I'm upping the stakes here with her story, like I need to match that. Like I need to, you know, be as brave as, you know, she wanted to be with her story. I also have to be that brave. And yeah, that was not super easy for me as sort of a closed off person anyway, but it felt important. That's great. Is there anyone else that you're reading or thinking about right now, any other writers past or present who really inspire you in terms of how they're able to, to think about and write about sex, sexuality, intimacy? Yeah, there's two books that I am in the middle of right now that are fantastic on this. And one is Disha Filia's The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Um, it's a short story collection. Um, it's hilarious, but it's also, it, it really, it deals with, um, for the most part, it deals with the sexual dynamics between women or, or, or between friends um, who are often affiliated with the church. So it's kind of all in the same territory of, of repression. And But she's, she's writing about it with such a sense of humor um, and humanity. Um, so I'm really loving those. And then I'm also reading um, a book that's not out yet, but it's by Azarine van der Vliet Alumi, um, and it's called Savage Tongues. Um, and that book is is super interesting. It's about a woman kind of revisiting a site of sexual trauma from her past. Um, like she and her friend kind of go back to this site, this house to relive this trauma. Um, and that's, it's fascinating. It's not like anything I've ever read. Mm. 
looks good. I've been talking to Jen Shaplin, whose book, My Autobiography of Carson McCullers, has been listed as a finalist for the National Book Award. Jen, thanks so much for chatting with me. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for having me.